Hello and welcome to Stuff That Interests Me with me, Dominic Frisby. Now, my guest today I met many years ago when I did the voice for an ad he was producing. He is an advertising producer. He's also a writer and a copywriter and an author. He is Paul Burke. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank How you, are you Dominic. doing? My Very pleasure. well, thank you. So let's start, <clears throat> let's start with the state of advertising. Because what, 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 it's one of these industries that kind of... It's a very boom-bust industry. What, what kind of state is it in at the moment? Yeah, um, it's in a bit of a state insofar as... <sighs> when's the last time... It, a cliche when we were kids was, um, oh, the commercials... Well, they can work. The adverts are funnier than the programmes. And when's the last time you heard anyone say that? Uh, there's a number of reasons for this uh, that... It's, it sounds like the uh, rantings of an old bore, but there's a, there's a grain of truth in it. Uh, the ads perhaps aren't as good as they were, because if you go to the cinema, the cinema was where you always had the best ones, you know, the, on the big screen. And when, when I had ads on the cinema, I just, just love sitting there and watching them go, oh, I did that, especially if people laughed in the right places. But now you're more likely to see mm, the left-hand drive Peugeot in, shot in candy stripe colours and, and all these hey people um, smiling along to an upbeat track. It's because they tend to use one ad, what they call pan european across the whole of Europe or across the whole of the world. And in order to make it understood by all markets, it's sort of dumbed down and just made a bit bland. Uh, so it's so lost it, its edge. It has sort of lost its edge. The other thing I'm afraid to say is true is uh, if there were a place in life where um, creative people went. Just, pre just pretend it's called creative school. And in the 80s, if you went to creative school, if there was such a place, the coolest thing to do was advertising. You want to go into advertising. So all the best people from creative school went to advertising. Now, there's so many other things. You know, people are, you know, designing apps, uh, doing video games, making short films, doing online stuff. So... I think the cream of the crop are going into other things because they don't want to make these candy stripe commercials for the whole of Europe. So the industry is possibly getting the not so good ones, I'm afraid to say. OK, but would it get better ones if it paid more? Is this a um, sort of lack of resources yeah, thing? Yeah, there's a sort of lack of resources. You, you used to get an awful lot of money, but then that is... T the other side of that is um, clients won't pay as much if they don't think the calibre of the people is so good. So it's a bit of a vicious circle. Um, I have to say that might be okay, no, uh, the product of the education system. It did go down a little bit in the 80s and 90s, and I think the people that turned up perhaps weren't as well educated. I mean, people that would call themselves writers, and they'd say to me, oh, you know, when I start to write books, oh, I'm going to write, I'm going to write a book. I thought, mate, you can't write a, you can't write a radio script. Uh, so there wasn't that rigour, there wasn't that um, discipline. But I think there is now. I think, I think schools have improved, certainly, in the last five, six years. So I think the next crop of people... And I was down at Falmouth giving a talk to students uh, where they do a big advertising course, and I'm thinking, oh, God, here we go. load of rubbish me millennials. And they were great. They were really good. Uh, so I'm optimistic for the future. OK. And what about the kind of the internet? Because, like you say, mm. the, the ads before a film are a big deal, but people yeah. don't actually go to the cinema as much as they used to, well, I believe. And TV ads were a big deal when there were three or four channels, yes. and then you got, like, 50 or 100 or 1,000 yeah. channels, and then you got the internet. Well, the, the internet, uh, a lot of it is they want people who are sort of internet savvy, but that's more of a technical thing. You know, you still need to have good ideas. It doesn't matter where, which platform those ideas run on, whether it's a poster or on television or on the internet, you still need people to write, fun, not necessarily funny, but original, well-written, well-shot things. Uh, I, I suppose the internet, and just the value was lost. In many ways, it's good that you, you know yourself, you can shoot, you can record something for a fraction of the cost that you used to. Mm. Uh, so the good thing is that, Anyone can do it. The bad thing is, they do. <laughs> so, I mean, it, yeah, there's always room for good ideas. When, when a good ad comes out, people, people love it. I, I can remember going to see a talk about a year ago by mm. a guy from, I forget which advertising agency, Sarch or someone, and he was talking about data in mm. advertising. And you know the story about how Target in America knew a girl was pregnant before she did? Do you I know this know, story? I don't. So by her habits, by her buying habits, they realised she was pregnant and they started marketing stuff that you mm. would sell to, to pregnant women to her. her. She was only 16, this girl. Her dad got really cross. 
email, you know, there was a big kind of argument with Target, and then two or three weeks later they discovered she was, she was pregnant. So this is, yes. and this guy was saying how data is just driving everything yes, in advertising. Is. And whereas once upon a time maybe it was 30 or 40% data, 60% creativity and imagination mm. and judgment, now it's maybe 80 or 90% data and 10 or 20% creativity. Yeah, I mean, there's always been data, but as we know, not to the extent that it's so easily and readily available and you are targeted, which is a bit creepy sometimes. Mm. I mean, I, I was writing some radio commercials. Um, there's two occasions, and I remember this. One was for Debenhams bathrooms, and one was for, oh, I can't remember, I think it was L'Oreal or Longcom. I was doing some skincare stuff. So obviously I went, they, they told me to, and I did. I went on their website just to, you know, have a look at it and see all the products. Oh, my God. Debenhams bathrooms and Longcom just followed me around every time I went on Facebook, every time, you know. Okay. And you just think, you know, it is a bit creepy, but... The trouble is that if something's invented, it can't be uninvented. Mm -hmm. uh, I just think the ads are a little more intrusive and a little more annoying than they used to be. It, it, I don't know. You, you, you'd all accept that if you were watching ITV or Channel 4 and, or listening to Classic FM that the ads, played for the, the ads paid for the platforms they occupied. But there's something annoying about... Sometimes like I've got to do a review of... Um, this year's Christmas ads, so I wanted to look at them. They're all on YouTube, so I go onto YouTube to find the, I don't know, the Sky John Lewis, ad, the John and, Lewis yeah. ad, and I have to sit through an ad before I get through an ad, <laughs> and you're just going to skip, skip, and sometimes you can't skip. So I think there's an, a, a resentment uh, towards the industry and the way they're at you all the time, in a way they're perhaps what uh, wasn't at some time. But what are you going to do? How important in an advert is the voiceover? The voiceover is extremely important. Um, well, it depends. It, it's, it's on radio. I do a lot of radio commercials. Um, it's the, it, very often it's the only thing. Uh, on television, it needs, uh, you have got the visuals uh, to not distract you, but they're, they're the main thing. And often I, I'll say that, oh, no, he's great. He's good enough for TV. He's not good enough for radio. Uh, so he might just say a little thing at the end, or she. Uh, the trouble is... People think that if someone's a good actor... I, I, can, I don't want to name them because it's not fair, but I can think of one particular actor who's great, he's fantastic, he's got such a screen presence. He's a really, you know, great actor. And we all, yeah, you, you'd know him if I mentioned him. Useless voiceover. Because once you've taken away his good looks and his presence, mm -hmm. all he had was his voice, uh, his diction wasn't that good, he couldn't... Um, kept stumbling over it. Uh, which is fine. Well, not fine, but... Um, his great strength is his, his appearance and his ability to act and, mm. and his expressions. So when you're just left with the voice, sometimes uh, they're not as good. If the the, the yeah. two skills between voiceover and acting is a bit like a Venn diagram. There's mm. a crossover there between is. the two, but they're, they're not, one doesn't necessarily mean you're good no. at the other. There's loads of good voiceovers who are rubbish actors, mm. often very over the top. There's loads of good actors who are terrible voiceovers because, mm. like you say, the diction's bad, they've got bad R sounds or something, yeah. their read is flat, they're stressing the wrong words. You know, it's, so it's, it's, it's rare that you find somebody who's good at both. Mm. John Hurt? Uh, John, John Hurt was, was fantastic. I, I remember using him... Because I still get a thrill out of doing those things, that I've written something... And someone off the telly. Very often I've seen someone yeah. on the telly or in a comedy club. And it's easy to find out who their agent is. And I've got this thing. It'd be good for that. He would or she would. And, uh, you know, on Thursday, there they are reading out loud something I've written. I mean, the lovely thing about the advertising industry, I mean, I'm not, well, I'm not poor, but I'm certainly not rich. But I have access. And not many mm. people can do that. I remember being in the street and uh, I was talking to this girl that I knew, you know, and suddenly Hugh Bonneville comes up, you know, hello, Berkey. And she's going, because to her, this man is, you know, the star of Downton Abbey. Mm. But to us, because we all sort of know each other and use each other, yeah, well, use them for voiceover, he's, he's just, um, not just, but somebody I've worked with. I think you forget how famous some people are. John, John Hurt, I could not believe. He had the hat and the scarf. And yeah. the, uh, just wonderful. One, yeah, he could do both. He could. He really could. Um, the joke is, how many actors does it take to change a light bulb? 20, one to change the night, light bulb, and 19 to say they could have changed it better. <laughs> yeah, no. But I'd, I often hear, I'm often watching a radio ad, or a, watching a radio, watching a TV ad, and there'll be a voice at the end, and it's a similar kind of category of voice to my own, and I'll go, mm. I could have done that better. And you probably could. And I probably could mm. have done. And it turns out it's the voice of, you know, somebody with the surname Fines, or <laughs> whatever it is. And so how much do you think advertising is... That thing that you described oh. of it's it's too obsessed with celebrity oh, and often doesn't 
actually, you know, they just want to meet the guy from yes. Breaking Bad. Or, or, or just to say that we've got the guy from Breaking Bad or whoever it is, they want to say that this person's in their ad. And they often want to, and can we get some publicity on the back of that? You go, no, he's doing it anonymously. And if you say, hello, my name's Ralph, Rafe Fiennes, you know, that's a different thing altogether. You know, he'd have to endorse it and that's not what they're there for. But I had a thing once, uh, I was work, I was trying to find a new voice for Sainsbury's. And they said, well, we want a well-known voice. So I've got this little file out that I keep that had um, 10 or 12 very well-known people, very well-known people, and, but I didn't name them. I said, there's voice one, voice two, voice three, voice four, see how many you can identify. And they're going. Tell me some of the names, or did you not want to? Uh, Dawn French was one, didn't know it was her. Idris Elba, didn't know it was him. Um, got, uh, I think Jennifer Saunders, as well, I think I put French and Saunders in there. Uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, because, you know, he's a wonderful actor, brilliant at Sherlock, but his voice sounds... It was a great voice, but there's it's lots of... A, it's, it's just, just a, a well-spoken... It's just yeah. a very well-spoken voice. The only ones they got were Chris Evans, because he's made his name on radio, so we're used to hearing him rather than yeah. seeing him. And also but, he's got a more distinct yeah, sound. Got very Personalities distinct have sound. a more distinct yeah. sound than actors do. And Barbara Windsor, because she's been around for donkey's years and has earned the right to be recognised. Yeah. And I said, look, there you go. Why don't we just try and find the best person for the job? And so we did. And... Uh, and I think yeah. I'm, that might, person might have been me, because I was the voice of Sainsbury's at one stage. Do you know, I think it was. <laughs> no, because there's, there's you and people like you yeah. um, who do this for a living. Who, um, it's Because the other thing I get sometimes is um, people with nice voices phone me up, or they get my number from someone, they go, uh, oh, this bloke phoned up and goes, uh, hello, um, Sainsbury uh, asked me to contact you. Um, yeah, I'd like to get into voiceovers. You know, he had a very nice voice. I said, oh, so what do you do at the moment? He said, well, I, I work as an analyst in the city. I said, oh, so, so you've got a job. Uh, and I said, look, I'm awfully sorry. You have got a nice voice, but so have all the actors that I use who have sacrificed everything to go to drama school, and this is what they do for a living. They don't have jobs in the city. And if you want to give everything up and just do this for a living, I would take a similarly favourable attitude towards you. Now, shut him up. <laughs> no, but really, and also, as you well know... Um, Having having a nice voice is only half of it. Yeah, it's having the tune. It's, like it's being able to yeah. stress the right words, being yeah. able to speak faster or slower, being able to change the the style yes. of your read. There's so many different because people go to me, can you do a lot of accents? And I think my range of accents that I can do has steadily shrunk mm. as I've got older because it's a practice. You have to keep practicing. I had something like a French accent is something I've always been able to do very easily, and then I had a job doing a French accent. I didn't even bother practicing. I just went and started doing the job. And as I was doing it, I started listening to my French accent and going, this is dreadful. Oh, really? This is Because I thought you could just do it. Well, um, I, so did yeah. I. You, but you have to practice. It's a fitness thing. You have to keep practicing it. But see, I... Um, <laughs> it's the, what, funny the way if you say, with all due respect, you say something that's got no respect. I know. You would say, oh, with all due respect. No offence, but... I would, yeah, no offence. I wouldn't use you for... I, because uh, I'd just get French bloke. Yeah, well. uh, Just because... Um, there's nothing worse because you can tell when it's a white person pretending to be black or a posh person pretending to be Not common. Not always. Not always, but with the genuine article so readily available, I'd always just get a French bloke. It's yeah. safer to go for that yeah. unless you're looking for comedy. Oh, yes. Well, and you, in which you, you case, it's often one. better to have the yeah. one step detached. Yeah, the one step detached, the way we think French people speak yeah. when they actually don't. Um, I'd have you for Italian, though, being half Italian, which was... Yeah, you wouldn't think he's half Italian, ladies and gentlemen. I've had <laughs> one... You know, I speak fluent Italian mm. and, and, and always have, and I do, you know, I've had one Italian voiceover in my entire life. That was me, wasn't it? Don From Mio, you. yeah. Don Mio, yeah. Yeah, but I saw you doing it, so I know. Yeah, <laughs> you do. No, it's, it's something, I do, uh, something I do enjoy. Um, so let's talk about um, if you were going to fix advertising, what would you do? Um, I would make sure the people that came into it, because ultimately uh, it, the buck has to stop with the people that create the ads. And, again, um, I know this is true, they originally paired a writer and an art director, and the writer was very good at writing, he was usually a frustrated playwright or novelist, and the art director, had, he might have done fine art, and he was, a, you know, he, for want of a better word, he could actually draw. Mm -hmm. um, and I would make sure those, those core skills, those craft skills were in place, because people often go, someone somewhere said, oh, it's all about the idea, and you go, no, it isn't. You know, the, every, uh, every ad, every piece of work, every, everything needs an idea. But I always think about Ricky Gervais going to the BBC with his idea. I've got this idea. 
It's called The Office. What's it about? Well, it's this really dull bloke who works in this really boring office in Slough, surrounded by boring people, and not much happens. They're not going to commission that, are they? You know, it was about the craft, it was about the casting, mm -hmm. it was about the writing. And uh, I think the commissioner yeah. actually had to be told how good the pilot of that was. Yeah. She didn't get it. No, well, you would... Yeah, uh, and that, that's the other thing. You, you get a lot of people that, um, that just don't get it. You know, they... There, there's, I, I think this applies to everything. It doesn't apply to television. Apply, it, there's just a lot more caution now. There is, people I, will say no because they can. Yeah, I just uh, remember in the 80s and 90s, people... There seemed to be... Like, I started doing ads in the 90s, but mm. I, think, I still think in terms of the 80s, there was a lot more glamour. Mm. It was, they probably had more money... They were maybe a little less accountable, yep. so they could get away with more. Um, now it's just all a bit careful. Don't want to upset the wrong no, people. Exactly. Uh, people. Want to push frightened. all the right buttons. And it, it, yeah, I mean, isn't that there's um, there's always a set of rules uh, that someone somewhere wants to tell you what to do. And when we were children, certainly when I was a child, uh, I remember that you know people didn't swear very much. You didn't blaspheme. Uh, you know, there'd be the, oh, no bad language in front of the ladies. Uh, there was a lot of deference and respect, even, you know, even in, into the 80s. And now it's a different thing. You, you can, you know, you shouldn't, I'm not saying you should, you should never be racist or sexist or homophobic, but there's an absolute terror of ever being seen that way. Yeah. And um, to me, sometimes it's almost racist in itself. I mean, I always remember a bloke who... Um, a black actor, again, I don't like to name people because they haven't given their permission with this actor. And he said to me, he hated EastEnders. He's coming through. I said, why? He goes, oh, the way they depict black people. I said, what do you mean? He goes, oh, the black characters in EastEnders are always... You know, he, he named, I can't remember, the doctor, the God-fearing landlady, the lovable rogue. He said the jobs, as an actor, purely as an actor, the roles that get you noticed, might get you a part in Hollywood, are... The dirty dens, the drug dealers, the thieves. Yeah. And they're only given to white people. <laughs> so in, in their obsession with uh, being politically correct, they're keeping black people down in the workplace. And Idris Elba had to go to America to do The Wire, where they're not so yeah. concerned about things like that, to get famous to then come back, because he couldn't get the meaty big roles... There are, but yeah, there are yeah. loads of cases of English actors going yeah, to America yeah. to get noticed in England. No, quite. Um, um, but, yeah, uh, but the Dominic West but, as well. Yeah, Dominic West, I was trying to think of his but name. But the, the, um, the, that's definitely an issue. Cause it's the, true, isn't the, it? Yeah. There was a thing of... There was a, I remember this in the 90s. Everyone was complaining that black people are only cast as drug dealers mm. and blah, 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 and, and, and essentially bad things. But actually, from the point of view of the actor... The bad guy is the best role. You know, Yago yeah. is a much better part yes, than Othello. Yes, of course it is. And, I'm, and I just... I mean, to, we, we were talking earlier before we came, came on air. I was brought up in Brent, which is the most multicultural borough in London, in Britain, probably the world. So my life, from an early age, my dad's Irish. I don't know whether you had um, aunts and uncles. You, uh, you, you, not aunts and uncles. Your friend's parents, you'd call them Uncle John and okay. uh, Auntie Shirley. My Auntie Ivy is Jamaican, you know, she's my mum's best friend. That's how closely integrated we were. There was Jewish people, there was an African family down the road. Um, that was multi but no one made anything of it. We were just all the same, you know. Yeah. And, and now, I, I find it uncomfortable that so much attention is drawn to the colour of somebody's skin. Yeah, my son yeah, is mixed I race. I don't like it. My, my eldest two children are both mixed race. Yeah. My, my but sister, they're my... so conscious of, of colour. Of, of like yeah. racial identity. This is a 17 year old boy and a 15 year old girl yeah. in South East London, which is probably like, you know, it's about oh, as yeah. multi as, as it gets. Yes, but they're so conscious of race. And it, it, in a way that we didn't, I'm no. sure I wasn't like that when no, I was. No, you weren't. Uh, when I was his age. And, and racism or, or any sort of discrimination, and, and you, you see it all the time. Uh, you know, I've been alive a long time. English is my first language. I know what you say. And then you have to go, sorry, run that past me again. You, you're favouring him or her because she's black or he's white or what? I've you got, know, I, I, I got, just can't, you know. I've, pitched, I've got a really good idea for a TV it. series and we've put together a really good proposal and I got a rejection note this morning did. <laughs> saying, and it actually said, talent-wise, we are only looking, talent-wise, we are looking for, only looking for diversity at the moment. Mm. And uh, that was basically, so was, they were saying no to me on the grounds of either... The colour of your skin. Either colour or, or gender. But, uh, but 
to be to have that actually said by a commissioner, it's pretty. You're not supposed to say no. That. I think um, I think that's illegal, it and I think be. I think that commissioner, whoever he or she is, should be prosecuted because you're just <laughs> well, you're discreet. If you yeah, did, but then you just come across as so bitter. No, but. Um, I, I just can't get my head around it. I know I'm sort of babbling, but I just never could. Um, I come from a background where you're treated the same, you know. I'm not, I'm not foolish or naive to, enough to deny that there is racism against ethnic non minorities. Of course there is, but on, the only way to address that is, is for it not to matter, for us to treat everybody with equality, dignity and respect. And it saddens me that we're living in slightly racist times where, where you know... The pendulum's the, gone the other yeah, way. Well, where it even matters. You know, you, you just think of a football team. You think of um, Wenger or Mourinho or anyone. They just get the best person for the job. They, they don't think about whether that person's black or what. You know, and I know there's nuances and it's not quite as simple as that, but it sort of should be a bit more simple. Just get the best people for the job. And and it shouldn't matter. It's one race, and, the and human they, race. They shouldn't, and it, it's, it shouldn't be race, gender, and celebrity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. No. Exactly. I'm a celebrity. It, it, the, if you're famous in a certain area, uh, for instance, we did some travel ads years ago. It was great. Um, uh, for I can't, I can't remember the name of the client now, but we use Alan Wicker. That's okay. fine. He's earned his stripes as the most famous travel journalist the world has ever known. So if you're doing, a, yeah, have him because. Um, He's associated with that with that sector, but just somebody who's famous, especially as you, well, certainly on radio, you won't recognise them. You yeah. almost certainly will not recognise them. People with famous faces do not have famous voices, generally speaking. That's a good little good little comment to think on, th true. to finish on. People with famous faces don't have famous voices. Right. Um, Paul, just as we close, mm. to tell us what you're up to at the moment and give yourself a plug. I'll give yourself a plug. Um, I've just completed some. <laughs> I'm not a drinker, which is really rare. I was brought up. Um, in uh, the Irish area of London. My dad was half Irish. I've spent my life in advertising, as, as you touched on. We, you were just knee-deep in drink and drugs. I've never bothered with any of them, not because I don't like them, uh, not because I'm frightened. Uh, I just never got into it. It's not a religious or a moral objection. So I, I um, pretended that now was the time I should take up drinking. So I've got a thing in The Spectator. If you Google the amateur drinker, I've written that. Um, I'm doing... I'm just always, just always typing, because if I didn't type, it's all I can do. It's that will sell the kids on eBay. We don't <laughs> do we? But, uh, <laughs> stick with the typing. I'll stick with the typing. Probably safer. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, and, uh, thank and, you. and and do you have to use Twitter or anything? If yeah, on? Um, at Paul Burke Radio. At Paul Burke Radio. Or PaulBurkeCreative.com. PaulBurkeCreative.com. Well, that's all we've got time for, ladies and gents. Thank you very much for listening. If you like the show, please share it with a friend. Please rate us. Please review us. And we'll be back with another stuff that interests me at the same time next week. I'm Dominic Frisby. Cheerio. Bum, 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 bum.